and also uh, for our prayer. Appreciate it very much. We're going to get out of here where it's toned down just a little bit for me. Anyway, uh, when you see there, it doesn't look as bright, but when you get up here, it's pretty bright, isn't it? And <clears throat> anyway, so how's everybody doing this evening? Good, good. You have a good day? Yeah. yeah. That's good. All right. And you have your Bible, more importantly. May I see them? Okay. Get them up. Very good. Very good. I like to see those Bibles. I take iPhones. Yeah, that's true. As long as you got the Word, correct? Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, Danny, where's your land? Where are you? Oh, uh, there you are. Uh, thank you for those words that you said, you know, about the books. <clears throat> you know, there's some men that really like to write books. I would not be one of those. Uh, Brother Clor has called me about four times to do another commentary. And uh, after I did John, 879 verses, and getting up every morning for about three years, around 3.30, and, you know, researching all day, um, that was enough for me. And it was like... 21 giant term papers, you know, for uh, each chapter of, of John. But um, it was a uh, it was good work for me to do. It really, uh, I mean, I already have loved the Gospel of John. It's been my favorite gospel, and it's that of many. But uh, it just caused me to appreciate it even more. I've often thought that if we didn't have anything from God except the Gospel of John, uh, that'd be enough to lead people to Christ and to ensure that they remain faithful. I mean, that's how significant that book is. And thanks for your remarks. Okay. Um, one again tonight with a couple of verses of Scripture in Matthew 7, 13, and 14. You know them well. Enter in at the straight gate, or wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be who find it. These two verses of Scripture have been used by many, many preachers, you know, to develop various topics. I know uh, I read a sermon one time from a guy who was two gates and two ways, and I thought, boy, that's a, that's a neat idea there. Well, I quote these verses tonight to <coughs> emphasize one main point. There are going to be more people lost than are going to be saved. Isn't that what it said? Yes. There will be few to go through the straight gate and the narrow way, and there will be many who will go down that broad way and enter the wide gate. Now, we can speculate about what you know many means and what few means, and at the end of the day, we would have just spent our time speculating because we don't know. But here's what we do know absolute certainty, more people are going to be lost than are going to be saved. And so my question then is this. <clears throat> Why is anybody going to be lost? Why is anyone going to lose their soul forever and ever? I just think about it. Uh, heaven is very, very concerned uh, about this question that I've raised. I mean, God doesn't want anyone lost, does he? Of course not. I mean, the passage of Scripture that we all learned whether we were brought up in the church or not. I was not uh, uh, raised in the church until, you know, later on. But um, I had a grandmother who was not even a member of the church, but she taught me John 3, 16, right? I mean, we all know that verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we know verses like 1 Timothy 2 and 4, speaking of God, who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Or Titus 2 and 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to whom? All men. So it's not God's will that anybody be lost. What about the Lord Jesus? Well, of course not. <clears throat> he doesn't want anyone lost. In Luke 19 and 10, the Bible says, The Son of Man is come to seek and save the lost. And then in Matthew 20 and 28, <clears throat> even as the Son of Man did not come to minister unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And then one of my favorite verses is Hebrews 2 and verse 9. 
But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste of death for whom? Every man. Y'all can talk to me sometimes. You, I, I give you a little clue, okay? But you don't have to. All right. Um, so that's an important verse. And then another, 1 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all you know, should come to the truth. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't want anyone lost. In uh, Revelation 22 and 17, the Spirit and the bride say what? Come. And then even in 2 Peter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy never did come by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So I have in my hands right here the Word of God. I have the Word of God given to me through men, men by means of the direction of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit doesn't want to see anyone lost. And then further, speaking of heaven's concern, the angels don't want to see anyone lost. In Luke chapter 15, the Bible tells us that the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. I mean, that's profound interest on heaven's part, isn't it? And so that raises a question. If God doesn't want anyone lost, if Jesus doesn't want any lost, if the Holy Spirit does not want anyone to be lost, and if the angels don't want anyone to be lost, then why in the round world is anybody going to be lost? I want to give you a couple of uh, responses. We'll see how, how we do. It's what, 7.25. All right. <clears throat> One of the reasons I think that some people are going to be lost is because they simply don't realize that they are lost. They don't know. Josh, they don't know. You know, God forbid that any one of us here tonight would be suffering from some kind of disease, perhaps even cancer, and be unaware of it. And when you're unaware of it, then guess what? You don't seek anyone's attention. You don't seek the help of a physician to identify the disease in hopes of developing a plan in which you can overcome the disease. So I think in a similar fashion, people are lost because they don't know that they're lost, and since they don't know they're lost, they don't seek the remedy by which they can be saved. Where is, where is that? That's right here, right? James 1 and 21. Lay apart all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. But there are many people, they don't realize that a failure to do good is sin. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. They do not realize that transgressing the law is sin. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever commits sin transgresses the law. They don't know that. And they don't know the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. They don't know that it separates us from God. Isaiah said it well in Isaiah 59, uh, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, uh, that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Or a verse I noted uh, yesterday, I think it was, uh, <clears throat> yesterday was Sunday, right? Yeah, it was, pretty sure now. I was really tired yesterday. I'm feeling a lot better. I'm going to get to feeling real good by tomorrow night. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's a hint of <laughs> the longevity of the lesson or not, but Danny's keeping me uh, well equipped with water, and so and I've got lozenges, and so my veins are running with cough drops and so forth. So at any rate, enough of that. All right, now, some people just don't know that they're lost. They don't know that a failure to do right is sin. They do not know that transgression of the law is sin. They do not know that sin separates them. <clears throat> now to my verse, 
1 Peter 3 and 12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord, what? Is against those who do evil. That's the verse we quoted yesterday. So, since they don't know they're lost, they do not seek the information by which to be saved. Just like if a person is suffering from some physical malady, but they don't know it, they do not seek you know, help by which they can be uh, perhaps healed. Now, <clears throat> every time I think of this, this particular point, I can't help but wonder are there some, perhaps even here tonight, who are maybe just thinking a little bit concerning people who are lost, and perhaps you're thinking, well, but what about those in the darkest places, you know, on the earth who never have heard the gospel? You know, Brother Danny, they typically phrase it like this, are the heathen really lost? You know, we've heard it phrased that way, right? Amen? Okay. Uh, I guess we have. All right. <clears throat> now, now let's just think about this. Are the heathen really lost or not? I mean, people in the darkest parts of the world. I mean, they've barely seen the sun's face, much less heard about God and Christ and their will for us. Are they lost? Someone says, oh, no, surely they're not lost. Well, if that's the case, then why should we expend our efforts on uh, trying to get missionaries to go to these places to tell them about Jesus. Wouldn't it be better to say, don't go? No pun intended. Okay. Now, I hear someone saying, now wait a minute, David. <clears throat> if they're not lost, and then you go tell them about Jesus, and they refuse to obey his gospel, then they become lost. You ever heard it put that way? I have. Now let's just think about this for a moment. <clears throat> Let me try to use an illustration. I know you think my illustrations are rather silly. Well, here comes another one. Let's say that some of us go camping. You ready? Some of y'all like to camp. I know you, you, you're bound to. Um, my idea of camping would be a uh, black and white TV with a window unit air conditioner. Okay, that's about as far as I want to go. I mean, I was raised kind of like camping, okay? You know, you've heard all those stories about feeding the chickens through the floor and everything. That would be me. Okay, but anyway, let's say we go camping, and, you know, some people who are like me, we're going to be on the bank, okay? I'm going to be the guy involved in the hot dogs or something, okay? Um, the crazy folks can get out in the water, all right? Um, they're out there playing, swimming, or whatever, in a river, no less, okay? And um, let's say here's this person who is, who is drowning. He's about to go down the third time. And if any of y'all can explain that to me, I would love to hear it. It's always said they go down three times. Isn't that what you've always heard? I don't get it. Why don't you just go down once and stay? Or, or you go down twice. Why is it three times? But that's a whole other thing. At any rate, so he's hollering for help, and guess what? He goes down the third time, and guess what? Unfortunately, he drowns. Now, later, those on the bank, it's me, are speculating about why he drowned. And I can hear one person saying, well, I extended a long pole to him, but he didn't take it, and that's the reason he drowned. And then another one says, <clears throat> well, I threw him a, a life preserver attached to a rope, but he didn't take it, and that's the reason he drowned. Now, am I the only one on the bank, yea, perhaps, you know, in the whole world that thinks that the person drowned because they were in the water? If they had not been in the water, guess what? They wouldn't have drowned. You see, people that stay on the bank, they don't drown. And so my point is this. You, but when you're asking to yourself, well, what point's that guy making? Well, here it comes. My point is, people are lost because of sin. That's the reason that they're lost. And there's, a, and there's a corollary to this lesson. That means that we have an incredible obligation to get the gospel in their hearts and minds. Because without it, they have no hope whatsoever in this world. 
Well, you don't mean that, do you, Brother David? I absolutely do. You hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 and 1. And to the Gentiles, Paul said that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Those people are lost. In the second place, some people are lost because even though they realize they are lost. See, my first category is they don't realize they're lost. But there are others who, even though they realize they are lost, they love the world. Now watch it. This is going to kind of ease up on you. And I'm going to explain it. They love the world too much. What do you mean by that, David? Well, I'm going to tell you. The word world is used in different senses in the Bible. In John chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says of the Word which became flesh, verse 14, who is named Jesus in verse 17, <clears throat> the Bible says that He was in the world and the world was made by Him and the world did not know Him. Josh, you got the same Greek word every time. <clears throat> but when He was in the world and the world was made by Him, what was uh, John talking about. He's talking about the earth. He's talking about the Grand Canyon. He's talking about Mount Everest and all of that, okay? But then the third time it's used, it says the world did not know him. He's not talking about rivers and lakes there. He's talking about human beings. And people did not know him. So you have the usage of the world to refer to the physical universe. You have the usage of the word world to refer to uh, to humankind, but those are not the two uses that I want us to think about now. Then in the third place, uh, you have the word world used to refer to the domain of Satan, like 1 John 2, 15 and following. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So now we have the word world used to refer to the realm over which the devil reigns. That's the third use. Then the fourth use is like Matthew 13, 22, <clears throat> where the Bible speaks of the cares of the world. Now, Okay, so we're not going to talk about the earth. We're not going to talk about human beings. We're going to talk about the third and fourth sense. Everybody with me now? You hanging on? We got a plan? Okay, let's work it. All right. <clears throat> the domain over which the devil reigns. Don't love that domain, John says in 1 John 2. That area over which the devil reigns constitutes what we call the works of the flesh. Galatians 5 and 19, following uh, the works of the flesh, are manifest. Well, what are they? They're these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also you know, told you, they who do these things will not seek the kingdom of God. They won't be there. That's that area over which the devil reigns. Do some people love that domain? Do they? Well, of course they do. Uh, listen to me. Are you listening? I know you are because you're quiet as mice. Okay. I should say mice, shouldn't I? Yeah, I'd be right. Anyway, um, if people did not love that domain over which the devil reigns, then guess what? We wouldn't, we wouldn't have any sinners. <laughs> but the very fact that we have a lot of sinners indicates to me that there must be some love for the realm over which the devil reigns. I've had people say to me concerning some terrible, you know, sinful thing that they hear about, uh, perhaps witness on the news or know about in the community, and I've had them, you know, <coughs> ask me, uh, Brother David, why do people, you know, do things like that? 
And it doesn't take me very long to respond. I say, they love it. They love it. Don't most of us do what we love? Isn't that right? Just think about it. We do. Now, I have a shop, and uh, I work on these old cars. Uh, I have ever since I was a little boy. And um, I've got a knuckle here that's enlarged. Now, the reason it is is because I've had an object in a vice, and I've had a chisel, and I've had a hammer. And, Glenn, sometimes I've missed, and I hit this right here. Oh, boy. But you know what? In all of the years that I've missed that chisel and hit this knuckle right here, not once, not once have I ever said, wow, I wonder how that would feel if I hit this one over here. I've never done that. Now, listen, there are people, um, that, believe it or not, they, they like pain, right? I mean, we've heard of those folks. Correct? But uh, we're not talking about those people, okay? I'm talking about, you know, normal folks. We don't like pain. When I go to the dentist, I say, load me up, whatever you got, gas, whatever. Okay, I'll take it. I get a shot. Uh, did you give me enough of that? Well, I can give you some more. I said, load me up. I don't even really want to know that I'm here because your tools sound like the tools in my shop. And that makes me uncomfortable, okay? And besides that, it hurts. But my point is this. We do what we love to do. And so there are some people who just simply love sin. Don't you know that? But here's what they fail to, to understand, apparently. They fail to understand that sin wears a mask. You know what a mask is? You see all kinds of masks, especially during what time of the year? Halloween. Okay. And boy, I'll tell you what, they're elaborate these days, aren't they? When I was a kid, we were lucky if we, if Mama bought a box of cereal that had a mask. Some of y'all remember that? There'd be a mask on the back of a box of cereal, and we'd cut that out and punch a hole on each side, and that was our mask. You know, now they got the whole outfit. I mean, it's scary to me. You know, I don't even want to see those young ones come by. But anyway, uh, sin wears a mask. So here's what sin does, and the devil behind it all. You see, it says, now, if you'll drink alcohol, uh, that'll make you forget your troubles or whatever. If you'll take these drugs, you'll be more uh, accepted in uh, certain uh, circles that you, you want to be in. And if you'll, if you'll steal, then um, you'll be able to get ahead a little faster. And so, see, the devil just goes down the list offering us things like that. But, see, the devil does not show us what is behind the mask. You see, the devil says, here, uh, drink alcohol. Uh, but the devil does not say, well, guess what? Some of you are going to be arrested for drunk driving. Some of you are going to have accidents and you're going to kill yourself. If not, you're going to kill somebody else. Uh, the devil doesn't say it's going to ruin your marriage. The devil doesn't say that you're going to lose your job over it, you see. See, the devil doesn't show us what's behind the mask. He only shows us, you know, what's pleasurable to us. Now, just think about it. What if the devil said, now, <clears throat> I want to get you involved in alcohol, for example, but and it's going to, you know, ease your pain or whatever. And then suppose the devil says, now let me tell you something. You're going to have a bad headache in the morning. Furthermore, I want to tell you that it's going to be very dangerous for you to drive. You might even have an accident. Furthermore, you're probably going to get angry, some of you, depending on your personality. And you're going to beat your wife up and maybe beat your kids up. The devil doesn't tell that. You see, if he told that, he'd be, you know, giving it away, wouldn't he? And he would not be able to necessarily win as many disciples to his side. And so for that reason, um, we have to be so aware of how the devil operates. He's a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And listen to this. You know what the devil's going to do? 
The devil's going to find your weakness. Every one of us have a weakness. For some, it may be money. For some, it may be something about the flesh. For some, it may be pride. Whatever it might be, the devil is going to you know, work on you in that area. That's what he's going to do. And guess what? If he is not successful immediately, he's going to go on to somebody else. But he hadn't forgot about you, he's coming back. But you see, the more we resist him, the more power that we have to overcome the, uh, the power of sin in our lives. You see, when we're saved, Mark 16, 16, we're saved from our past sins. But as we grow and develop as Christians, we are being saved from the power that sin has in our life. The more we resist the devil, the more he'll leave us alone. And then eventually when we go to heaven, we will uh, be uh, saved from the very presence of sin. And so, <clears throat> we have to be careful. We have to be careful about temptation. I want to give you a verse, and I, will, I wish all of you would go memorize it. Some of you already know it. I bet you, I bet you Wendy and, and, and Liam and, and he, he's, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot your, your brother's name. Uh, who is it, Glenn? <laughs> Corbin? Okay. He is your grandson? Okay, maybe y'all ought to get together or something. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, hey, guys, and the other young people here, I want y'all to memorize this verse. I know you can do it. You're smart. You ready? You ready for it? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'm going to see which one of y'all will quote it to me tomorrow night. How's that? I mean, I'm giving you the rest of the night. You can learn it. Good night. I used to could memorize a verse, read it three times. So y'all are young and smarter than I am. You can do this. So memorize it. All right, you ready? Here it is. There's three points in this, Josh. Now, here's a sermon for you. Danny, you probably already have it. Y'all need to make a sermon out of these three points and make me a copy and send it to me, okay? Are you ready? Here it goes. I'm going to quote it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. First point. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What's that point? Temptation is universal. Josh, don't you think for a minute, you know, you're tempted in a way that has never been around before. It's been around. Same is true of me, it's true of you. It's been around forever. So we're not the lone ranger, you see, when temptation comes our way. But then in the second place it says <clears throat> that God is faithful and will not, listen to this, this is just, you know, meaningful to me. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able to bear. I've had students, <clears throat> Danny, you know my office well. I've had students come in there, and you know that chair, and, I, and they, they got, they're just overwhelmed with these problems. And, and they'll say, uh, they used to say, uh, Dr. Life, I just couldn't get out of it. it, was, it you know, it, it was just more than I could bear. And I'd say, have you got your Bible with you? No, sir. Well, I got about 40 here. Take your pick. I said, look up 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is able. Is our God able? Amen. Yes, he's able. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can deal with. I'll tell you, that's comforting to me. But then I like this last part. Number three, there's an escape plan. But he will, with that temptation, make a way of escape for you. What do you think about that? So every time temptation comes my way, I say three, I say three things to myself. I've been saying it for years and years. I say, David, number one, this temptation's been around a long, long time. Don't think that, you know, it's just being tried on you. Number two, God won't allow me to be tempted above what I can bear. And number three, 
there's a way out. Where's the way out? And then I love to think of the example of Joseph, you know, that we talked about yesterday. You know, when Potiphar's wife is attempting to seduce him. <clears throat> you remember he said, how can I do this sin and sin against God? You remember that he got out of that temptation. I told you that. How did he look? He didn't look too good. How do I know? Because he left his clothes behind. <laughs> So you may not look really good getting out of something, you know, but the important thing is to get out of it. Have you ever put your foot in your mouth? Oh, I have. You remember that episode of Andy where Opie, you know, wouldn't give but three measly cents, you know, to, what was it, the children's fund? Some of you remember that? Can I see a nod? Okay, nobody had seen here, one human being. Okay, thank you. At any rate, at the end of it, of the story, he was saving money to buy a coat for his girlfriend, you know, who didn't have a coat for the winter time. And then they sat down at the table, and Opie says, Pa, what are we having? And uh, Andy said, well, <clears throat> you're having fried chicken, but I'm going to be eating crow. <laughs> Sometimes we have to do that when we put our foot in our mouth. And let me tell you this, just go ahead and eat it. It has a bad taste, but just eat it. Because if you try to wiggle out of it, it's just going to get worse and worse. I know what I'm talking about because I've tried it both ways. I finally said to a person that, I mean, it was getting worse and worse. You know, see, here's the thing. You want to look good when you, you know, you're trying to get out of sticking your foot in your mouth, you see. You don't want to look bad. You want to look sharp, you see. And I finally said to this person, <clears throat> let me just stop and say, I've put my foot in my mouth. I'm sorry and I hope you have a nice day. I'm telling you, that's the best line to use. Just go for it. Remember it. And so what we have to do sometimes with temptation is, is similar. We just have to get out of it. It doesn't matter what we look like, you know, trying to get out of it. Just get out of it, you see. Because the more you try to think about looking good, getting away from the temptation, guess what? The more the devil's going to be pulling you into it. Some people are lost because they love the world. <clears throat> and on that world, we don't want to add the two words too much because loving that world is wrong, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, okay? Everybody with me now? Okay, but there's a third use of the word world. Or which one? Is, yeah, I'm on my third. Maybe I'm on my fourth use. I think I'm on my fourth one. Where Matthew 13, 22 speaks of the cares of the world. Now, Brother Daniel, when I first studied that, I thought that the cares of the world referred to, um, like, what we just talked about, you know, the lust of the flesh and, and so forth. But that's not what Jesus is talking about there. He's talking about innocent things, a care. Let me give you an example. Um, you know the two sisters, Mary and Martha, right? You know, Martha was the oldest and she was ever the practical one, okay? You know, she's taking care of the house, maintaining order and all that. Where do you always see Mary? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's studying about spiritual things. You remember that time that, that Jesus came over to their house, and Jesus was in the living room, sitting in the latest lazy boy that they had, and he was talking about spiritual things, and Mary was sitting around his feet, Oh, she is just absorbing it all. And Martha's in the kitchen. She's burning up, trying to fix dinner. And she comes out, and she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister's not in here helping me in the kitchen? To which Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things, but Mary has chosen, you know, the best thing. She's not going to have me forever. And so... It's important to do what Martha was doing. And we love Martha, but we got to remember to keep our priorities straight. Everybody with me on that? Now, actually, I'm going to do a lesson tomorrow night where I'm going to develop this point in greater detail. And because of our time, I'm going to leave it right now. Okay? And I'm going to come back to it tomorrow night. I'm going to tell you more about it. Can I do that? Okay. Because <clears throat> as I was studying my lesson today, I saw I had an overlap. Okay, number three, where were we? Number one, some are lost because they 
uh, they don't know it. Number two, some are lost because they love the domain over which Satan reigns. Some are lost because they love uh, the cares of the world too much. Number three, some are lost because they believe a lie. Oh no, Brother David, you don't mean to tell me that God would let you believe something that's wrong. Well, just think about it. Did he let Adam and Eve believe something that was wrong? The devil, you know, spun a lie, didn't he? Of course he did. And guess what? Eve believed it. And then Adam, he's just some kind of dumb knucklehead, it appears to me. You know, he just sort of walked right into the deal. But Eve was deceived, you know, by the devil. Okay? So you can believe a lie. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, about 10. With all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be condemned who believe not the truth, <coughs> but took pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, some people don't love the truth. And guess what? You know, for those people, you know, God lets them believe a lie. It's kind of like dealing with our children. <clears throat> you know, sometimes our children are going to just do what they're going to do. You had that experience before? You know, I have. Have you ever used this, used this expression? Okay, hardhead, go ahead. <laughs> you see? I mean, we, we don't like that. I always hated using that. But you see, God... If it's like, okay, you want to believe a lie? You don't love the truth? Okay, there you go. We can believe a lie. And you know what that means? That means that we've got to think for ourselves. We've got to use our minds. <clears throat> when we come to a particular belief or practice, now just y'all listen to me? Bear with me. Just Y'all are just wonderful. Can I take you home? Because you listen so well. And that's the reason my, some of my sermons get a little long. It's not my fault. It's you. Okay. But anyway, uh, uh, where were we? Believe in a lie. We've got to think for ourselves. Yeah. Okay. When we come to some belief or practice, do you know what we bring? We bring to that, to that particular point, you know, where we're going to start thinking about something. We have what I call mental baggage. And in this bag over here, I've got what, you know, my mom and daddy told me see, growing up. And in this bag over here, I've got what the elders handed down to me. And in this bag over here, I've got what my Bible class, you know, teacher was telling me. And in this bag over here, I've got what's going on in the community. You see, I'm loaded with baggage that's interfering with my thinking. And so then I start looking at something and I'm thinking, hmm, well... The elders have always said this, or mom and daddy has always said this, or, you know, or, or whatever. And that impedes our thinking. And it's really hard for us to strip ourselves of all of this baggage and use our own minds. I used to teach a course at Freed Hardeman <coughs> called Values and Human Thought. You remember it, Danny. I think you uh, strayed and took somebody else. Uh, if I'm, oh, did you have it with me? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, but at any rate, you might not remember this, but in the first class, I would say something like this. Young folks, my task here is not to necessarily change your beliefs and your practices, but my task here is to help you own, O-W-N, own your beliefs and practices. You see, <clears throat> one of the advantages I had of not being raised in the church because I didn't have anything to influence me, <laughs> you see. I had to work it all out. You know, come to whether we got, can have a piano in the church or whether we can have women preachers or whatever. I had to work it out in my own head. I didn't have anything, you know, that was in, in any kind of bag. I didn't have any bags. Okay? And so what we have to do is it, you may believe what your parents believe, and if they're believing what is right, then God bless you. But sometimes we may have to say, now, Mama, 
I don't think that's just exactly right according to the scriptures. And so this is where I've got to land. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You want to believe what you believe because it's what the good book says. You see? Not just because of what your significant other said, you know, in your life, but because it's what God said. That's the kind of person I want to be. When the Passover was instituted, I left my notes because if I go over there, it's going to be too long. Okay? Uh, when the Passover was instituted, where was that? Exodus 12? Is that right, Dan? I think so. Do you remember that God said, one of these days, your children are going to rise up and ask you, what does this mean? And then God said, you tell them that you were delivered out of slavery by a mighty arm. You know, I'm your deliverer. I am the one God Almighty. You tell them that story. And so I translate that into our setting today. We have this Lord's Supper up here. John, you did such an incredible job Sunday with that. <clears throat> we don't want to just, well, let's, let's just have a prayer. Okay, pass the trays, or in y'all's case, the uh, uh, emblems. <clears throat> <clears throat> Whatever. What, is that the name? Okay. Anyway, I mean, I know they're emblems. I was trying to think of the container. Anyway, we don't want to just let that go by and our young people just see that happen every Sunday after Sunday and them not know what's happening. Do we? You see, I've had parents <coughs> get on me at Freed Hardeman. <coughs> Excuse me. Because... They, they sent their child, here's what they'd say, we sent our boy to Freed Hardeman, and unfortunately I didn't hear this but on occasion, and now he's left school and he's in a denomination. How do you explain that, they'll say to me. And I say, well, we're all free moral agents. We all make our own decisions. Well, we sent him up there for y'all to straighten him out. We never could do anything with him. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> <You see? clears throat> it's kind of too late now. Let's pray that, he'll, that he will come back. Some people don't own their beliefs. I hope that's making sense. Own what you believe. Don't, don't young people, don't hold on to a particular belief just because your mama gave it to you. <clears throat> now, initially, you need to do that. If you're a three-year-old kid on a tricycle like me in Joliet, Illinois, and my mama said, don't ride your tricycle out in the street, I still remember that. And then I get a whipping because I didn't listen to what she said. You see, there's a time you need to listen and just do what they say. But then as you mature, you need to ask yourself the question, is this what the Bible says? Is this what God wants in my life? You see what I mean? I'm not preaching here, uh, Karen, Glenn. I'm not preaching rebellion here on the part of the children. I'm preaching that we need to study and think for ourselves. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you what this good book says. This good book says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We all know it, right? You know how to diagram a sentence? What's the subject? The simple subject, he. What's the simple verb? Shall be saved. Who shall be saved? The one who believes and is baptized. Hello? I mean, if you can see through a ladder, that's pretty simple, isn't it? That makes sense to me. So the one who's going to be saved is the one who believes and is baptized. Saved from their past sins. And then the Lord Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you'll all perish. So that's pretty important. Get off the devil's side, get on the Lord's side. And then Paul tells us to confess with our mouth. And so um, that's, that's really pretty simple. But it's a matter of accepting it. Everybody has enough cognitive ability to understand what I just said. And if there are impediments, it's not up here. 
It may be for psychological reasons. There's, some, there's something else that's interfering with them following through. But I want to challenge you tonight to go with what you understand. And then the Lord loves us so much that when we mess up, He still wants us to come back home, right? He wants us to ask for forgiveness and ask the brethren to pray with us and pray for us. For us. That's what my plea is tonight. I wish tonight you'd make this night be the night that you made that decision for the Lord if you've not done that already. Will you come as Brother Josh leads us in song?